All right, I think we are good to start. Um, so thank you everyone for joining this webinar today. Uh, from Bytes to Insights, a journey through online data and criminological studies. I'm excited to jump into a hot topic of conversation today. But uh, first, quick background about myself. I'm Robert Stoke. I'm a privacy program manager inside Venable Blue and a part of the Musa program. I formerly spent time inside big tech and state and local government within the state legislature. I've worked inside companies that have dealt with un unauthorized scraping. And with Musa, I help companies navigate the world of scraping. For those that don't know about Musa, Musa is the Mitigating Unauthorized Scraping Alliance that brings together companies, regulators, academics, and experts in the field to help with the conversations and dialogue around unauthorized scraping. And with that, I'm pleased to give an introduction for Dr. Thomas Holt, who's here with us today. So Thomas J. Holt is a professor in the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University. His research focuses on computer hacking, malware, and the role of the internet in facilitating all manner of crime and deviance. His work has been published in various journals, including Crime and Delinquency, Deviant Behavior, the Journal of Criminal Justice, and Youth and Society. I'm sure Dr. Holt will give more details on the exciting world he lives in. Um, and there's a lot more to his background than what I just described, and I'll leave that to Dr. Holt later on. I want to set some, I want to set the stage um, today and bring some more context to the conversation that we we're having. And we will save about 10 to 15 minutes for QA at the end if you want to enter those live as we go along in the chat. The chat can be found at the bottom. We're also maybe going to answer some live Q&A. Um, so please continue to enter, enter those into the chat live. Um, just adding some context, today we will be exploring the evolving landscape of criminological research with a specific focus on online data sources. Drawing insights from Professor Holt's soon to be released uh, white paper titled Assessing the Use of Scraped and Hand Collected Online Data to understand crime. We will dive into the methods employed by scholars over the last two decades, emphasizing the shift towards automated scraping tools and manual data collection, which is a big topic that I'm, uh, I'm sure people are gonna be picking sides when it comes to researchers collecting data and solving crimes, while also upholding companies' terms of service and best practices when fighting against unauthorized scraped, scraping of data. So just a warning, Professor, I have worked inside some of these companies and I know we've chatted about this. Um, I may have a different perspective on some points than you do, but I'm sure we're gonna have a great conversation today and I promise to be nice. Um, and with that, let's get started. So Professor Holt, how did you end up studying criminology and deviant behavior and, and some giving some more in-depth background to, to your experience here? Sure. So when I started college, I thought I wanted to be an attorney and uh, I took a criminal law class and either it was the instructor or myself, but either way, it just was not clicking for me in the way that I thought it would. But I still loved the idea of studying crime and deviance and uh, the professors at the university I was at were really uh, good at doing research on active offender communities and kind of helping to understand why people offend. And that part really connected with me in a meaningful way. And I thought, well, maybe there's something that I can do in criminal justice that isn't being an attorney or being a police officer. And I really liked the idea of doing research that um, was something that I found I was really passionate about. And so I thought, well, I'll go to grad school. Maybe I can be a professor and it, it all wound up working out. That's awesome. I, I have a... Similar experience in getting to the trust and safety, privacy and security space, and just that passion that that bring you bring to you know the protection of users and, and the online harms that exist. Um, can you give us a, a brief overview, a little bit more of an overview of this paper that that will soon be open to the and available to the public? Sure. So when I started as a as a researcher, the idea of using online data was very novel. Most of the criminologists in the world were using interviews or survey data or, you know, official materials that they could find from certain places. And the use of forums and things like that were very novel. 
And slowly but surely, it's become a very standard and accepted form of data collection and analysis. But we're at a point where there's real inconsistencies in an understanding of what's ethically acceptable, what are the responsibilities of the researcher, what are the best practices that can be employed, how do they vary across platform, and uh, to what extent do we have any kind of um, understanding in total of who's using more, unfortunately, outdated methods like hand collection compared to big automated processes of scraping from different sites. So the, the goal here was to kind of wrap our arms around how much research has been done and in what areas and what can we gather from the, the ways that data is being collected from various platforms. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And how are you using the collection of data and criminology to understand crime? And, and what type of crime are we talking about in this context when we, when we talk about criminological research? Yeah, criminology as a discipline is one that kind of sits at the intersection of multiple fields. We actually came from sociology and became our own unique discipline that borrows from a lot of other fields. So you can find people doing work that is at times uh, psychological or behavioral or biological even in some cases. And increasingly we're at a point where we're doing research that has computer science and engineering applications but it's done in ways that vary to the individual researcher. And you can find people doing work on behaviors that we might traditionally think of with respect to say, uh, traditional forms of theft or the measurement of crime through online methods. Like if someone is tweeting about crime in a, in a specific place, can that be linked to general crime trends? Uh, to things like terrorism, extremism, radicalization, uh, and sexual deviance, and really any kind of behavior that's at the boundaries of social acceptance. And what are some of those methods in the way data is collected in order to solve that, those crimes? Those those topics you just mentioned, like extremism and terrorism, um, using this now approach, which I think uh, has evolved over time, to solve some of these crimes. Yeah, at the moment, we're seeing people using one of two ways. The first being automated scrapes, and those can take a variety of different forms. Some people are using the APIs, some are not, and uh, that raises questions depending on what kind of platform you're in. Some are using really custom-tuned products to go through forums or dark websites. And then others, um, myself included, fall into this category of utilizing hand-collected data. And there's strengths and weaknesses of using both, but it seems as though hand collection is more in the minority today. There's much more of an emphasis on data scraping or automated collection. Right. And formerly uh, being inside the, the tech companies, you know, automation is always key in automating things and making things evolve and work faster um, for the better and, and to pr provide those safety nets. Um, you touched upon scraping, and I think for the, you know, for those that are listening in, uh, it would, what, what is scraping? And then you mentioned automated scraping and, and unauthorized scraping. Well, you know, what are, what are we talking about when we talk about scraping, the scraping of data and data collection? So in this case, we're talking about the use of some kind of a script or a tool that will go through the contents of a website, whether it's a major platform like Reddit or X, or even going against uh, forums or websites that are hosted by individuals on various platforms and web hosting services. So the scraper will go through and automatically save the content that's posted on those sites. In many cases, this is going to just break down into a flat file, like a, a SQL database or something else, even just an Excel file, depending, capturing very specific pieces of information that are of interest to the researcher. In some cases, this is going to be very wide, and so they'll collect every single thing with HTML tags and other information. And in other circumstances, it can be really narrow, and perhaps you're only collecting the, the text from posts in, uh, say, a forum or, or something specific. So the researcher has the ability to fine tune how it's going to work and in what ways. And with scraping, especially, you can do it in high or low bandwidth fashions where you're collecting slowly so as to appear as though you're a regular user in an attempt to not overwhelm the site or its resources. 
but some first time researchers or some people who aren't necessarily familiar with the tools may inadvertently configure them and just have it go wide and suck down everything all at once that causes kind of a short term outage or might even lead to their IP address being blacklisted for the tool collection because it's effectively damaging the site. Yes, I think we we touched upon some what would be considered unauthorized scraping and 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 do you see these um, so the collection of data over time the evolution um, researchers and scholars maturing the way they use online data do you what what challenges are you finding here like over that evolution of time and and does it do some of those challenges include violating the terms of service and and what programs maybe are offered um, and in ways that academic and, and companies can work together to, you know, maybe avoid those challenges or solve for those challenges? So this is very tricky because in some respects, some researchers really understand the terms of service. They've read them carefully. They fundamentally understand if I'm going to use the API, I have to work under these very specific parameters. The challenge for that, however, comes on the back end, where certainly you may have collected the data appropriately, but then how do you manage it in a way that conforms to the expectations of the platform? If there's an argument, for instance, that the, the deletion of a post by a user has to be reflected in the state of the database that you've aggregated, how do you do that at scale? How do you as a researcher, say two years on, go back through and audit your data so it directly matches what's been posted there? That's something I, I don't really know if people are doing uh, or, or doing in a way that would satisfy service providers. So that's a, a tricky one. Yeah, definitely. Um, it actually reminds me of, I, I went to the doctor recently and there's the checkbox, yes or no, for the use of your data. Um, in in terms of research, and you know, I think part of that tricky part is that, as you're saying, is the transparency, transparency, accountability of having that checkbox and knowing, um, and having those resources that companies can provide and do uh, provide varying across companies um, to be able to be more transparent in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that's a major issue. Yeah, yeah, um, and I definitely do want to kind of. A slight change of topic, cover the four general areas of criminological scholarships that you mentioned throughout your paper. Mm -hmm. um, can you provide some more insights for folks of what, what that means or those four areas? Yeah, so in general, while the field is really broad, there are some very distinct areas in which people seem to have focused their work. Uh, the first is on terrorism and extremism. So the ways in which individuals are posting in communities either to express real threats or to uh, discuss their views and uh, communicate ideas that could serve as a basis for radicalization. And we see people using the resources from, uh, from Reddit, from Twitter, from other platforms, but also uh, coupling in forums and other data sets that are on what you might argue fringe websites or, or forums as well. So you see a lot of different collection from these different communities. Uh, secondly, we can find a lot of research looking at online illicit markets. These mostly are going to involve, say, websites hosted on the dark web or the open web. These are not, say, Reddit or Facebook or meta-related products, but instead are a little bit more narrow and operated by criminal entities or, or individuals involved in some kind of malfeasance. Um, from there, we see people researching sexual deviance and sexual offending because there are so many different platforms that exist for legitimate adult content, but then also things that move into sex work, which may or may not be legal, depending on where you are. Again, most of this is going to come from forums or platforms, but there are occasional investigations of um, Reddit or Twitter or a, a site called FetLife that's kind of a, a kink-specific social media platform. And then uh, lastly, we have kind of general crime and deviance explorations. And these run the gamut of behaviors. These can be everything from people studying anabolic steroid use to eating disorders, um, traditional crime, but also things like how um, individual communities utilize public safety groups as a means to police their space and how they negotiate those environments, whether it's on Facebook or any other social media platform. Yeah, and uh, I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, you use a keyword that just pops in my head, like investigation. 
And so across these four areas, do you four areas, do you see a difference in the approach and balance of automated versus manual collection? Because maybe for let's say terrorism content, it, it doesn't need to be captured at scale, uh, at scale the data collection, or maybe it does. Is there a difference there and a difference across the four that you can uh, dive deeper into? Yeah, sure. So the main thing that seems to drive the selection of either scraped data or hand collected data is kind of the individual researcher. As an example, with something like terror or extremism, there's tremendous value in seeing how people are messaging on major social media platforms. How are they potentially communicating ideas to one another? But then there are also these less common platforms like Gab or Parler or some of the other social media platforms that don't have quite the same uh, uptake as other places. So in those communities, researchers are far more interested in scale data collection. You can do things like track the use of radical phrasing or more extreme language over time, view entrance and exit from a community that we might treat as proxies for desistance. So you start, does your posting behavior peak and then dip? And is there a relationship between how you communicate and the frequency with which you're communicating? So that is something that we see more uh, scraped data being used for. But there are still individuals who are using hand collection from specific forums because some of these are very fringe groups that might have very niche community dynamics. And so being able to access a, a telegram channel and just look at one group in depth is helpful. Uh, we see this to some degree with online illicit market research as well, because in some cases, these are small niche uh, markets for different products, whether it's uh, stolen data services or people who are selling counterfeit identity documents or things like that. But then there are people who are using major scraping tools to collect from uh, major crypto markets where people are selling narcotics and other substances. And so there's benefits to each method. It really just depends on what the researcher is interested in examining. Definitely. And um, with that and understanding like the more in depth on how the collection methods and, and the processing of data happens, what would you advise or how can researchers identify and mitigate risk associated with massive data collection um, via automated scraping tools? Um, how, how can researchers mitigate that risk? The most important thing is understanding what exactly it is that you're collecting and are you doing it in a way that will not violate the terms of service of the site or their rules regarding data collection. It's getting very hard as an academic, and I'm speaking mostly for myself, but I know I've heard from a few colleagues as well, this idea of general data privacy rules and how does that impact collection from a site like Reddit or Twitter or even just changing in terms of service? How do we collect data in a way that won't impact those individuals? So you have to be very mindful of legal protections for the sites, legal protections for participants. Um, and that's very hard because in traditional social science research, like uh, if I were interviewing gang members, I would have an informed consent document that they read and they're agreeing to participate. And I'm required to keep their responses confidential and private, unless for some reason they mention uh, a willingness to commit a murder tomorrow or there's some credible threat that I have to respond to. But in a social media environment or a forum, I have no necessary means of identifying the individual making those posts. I can say it's a username, but there's not necessarily a guarantee that it is the individual's real identity. And where does that correspond to in physical space? So in some respects, we do a lot of work in a covert fashion. We are assuming that public posts, even quasi-public if it's in a site that's just password protected, is not necessarily a human subject's concern because I don't know that it's you, I just know someone with this username did this behavior. And as a result, we work within the constraints that we think are appropriate, but not every university agrees on what is human subjects and what is not. And so it's, it's a hard space to navigate and there's inconsistencies across the board. Yeah, definitely. I think that goes into the topic area of like ethical considerations in online data research um, that you're touching upon is what ethical considerations should researchers keep in mind when working with online data? What are some of those things that I know you mentioned at the very start? Like, if we can list those out or go through those, what are some of those? 
Yeah, some of the most immediate risks for data collection or some of the best practices? Some of the best practices when thinking ethically and taking in considerations when the data collection process starts. So since we aren't getting tacit approval from individual respondents, in some cases, people do obtain consent, but it's it's inconsistent at best. So if we're talking about data that we've collected from a major platform where we can pretty easily identify a person just by putting a quote into Google, then there's a pretty heavy emphasis on us as researchers to try to shield the individual identities of the participants in the, in the process. Because if I'm drawing from a community where no one has tacitly approved that, yes, I can use their posts, that presents some downstream risk for them where suddenly they're being able to be identified in an article that was published in some academic journal. So there is some sense of responsibility. Not everyone agrees with this, but I feel like it's a, it should be a best practice that we don't name the exact platform where we collected our data. We don't give the exact websites where we drew materials from. Now that complicates the process uh, from an academic standpoint. Well, then how do I replicate your study if I don't know exactly where you pulled content from? But it's really the only way that we have to ensure that we at least give a modicum of privacy to the individual posters. If we don't say where it's from and we don't use the exact screen name, then it adds some difficulty for people to figure out who made those posts. That's kind of a simple step that we can take. The other is in ensuring that we are conforming to the expectations in terms of service for the sites themselves. If we're doing a, a scrape that suddenly triggers anti-DDoS protections from the uh, site, well, then that's a problem. We've, we've misconfigured our tool, whether by accident or unintentionally or, or otherwise, we have to be mindful of how we're collecting and what it is that we are exactly collecting and how do we conform to expectations about data management. In the social sciences in particular, we get federal funding and there are sometimes expectations that you'll post that data publicly in some repository so that others can use it. Well, how do we do that if we're talking about a scrape of Twitter data or Facebook groups or something else where individual names and real identities may be posted? So how do we anonymize it in a fashion that is going to minimize risk later, especially when we talk about terms of service where, well, you should have deleted these posts before it was posted. Well, that what do we do when it's a third party now that's managing the data? There's some some real complexities there. So understanding all of these in advance and taking all the steps possible to insulate your participants and the kind of security of your data as you work is is going to be vital. Right, and I I think the that brings up just the complexities between researchers and and the companies that uh, host the terms of service and and keeping that. Um, privacy upheld and, and keeping the confidentiality. Do you have any recommendations on how researchers can best uh, maintain the privacy and confidentiality of users that um, this data is being collected from? Yes, um, first and foremost, my primary concern would be, especially if you're collecting a huge amount of material from a site, that you post it in a place for secondary analysis that is secured. Your data is only as safe as your password if you're putting it on some cloud storage feature. So you might think it's safe, but in the event that it's compromised, suddenly, well, you have lost control of all that information. And if you've aggregated a lot of detail, then suddenly you've put very sensitive information potentially into the public's hands. So um, storing it carefully, anonymizing storage would also be vital. We think of this traditionally in the social sciences as something that you can do easily. Like if I have a, a survey, well then you're just number 400 as a survey participant and I can't link your identity to the survey response. And we can do that through different ways, like removing usernames, removing HTML links, trying to de-identify the data as best as possible before we store it and before we analyze. That way, in the event there's some kind of a data breach, we've at least stripped as much as we possibly can from the content. That gives at least some layer of, uh, of security for the users. It doesn't guarantee privacy, but you're at least taking the, the best possible steps to move forward. And beyond that, when we're thinking about 
uh, data management on the back end, then it comes down to you really understanding the terms of service and the agreements within that platform, which is very hard. Um, I will be honest, I don't necessarily understand all those terms of service. And so this is the kind of thing where IRB education um, in academia, we use what are called institutional review boards to vet research before it's conducted. These institutional review boards don't always understand online data collection methodologies. And so if we could educate IRBs a little bit better and make sure that they understand what is safe, what is not safe, what are these terms of service, then we can ensure at least consistent uh, analysis of a proposed study and encourage different strategies and ensure we're conforming to expectations. This is even true in some respects with uh, university council. So if they understand, hey, if you're going to work with data from this platform, here's what you need to do so we minimize any liability to us. Uh, there are a couple of universities, for instance, that maintain data from Parler or from a variety of different websites and forums, and they advertise these as services like um, Cambridge has their uh, big cybercrime database, which encompasses tons of forums and scraped data from a lot of different places. Well, if you're saying this is Cambridge's data set, does that introduce any legal liabilities for Cambridge as an entity? Right, right. And um, something that's used often, and, and I'm curious to know, and this may vary across companies in the industry, uh, do companies offer like research programs and provide that education or what we would call it internally TLDR is too long, didn't read, but really break down what's needed and necessary um, to understand those risks you were just and challenges you were just talking about in order to work better together, in order to lay that out so um, those risks are minimized and, and, and we can do this, uh, you know, for the safety of users and protection of users and privacy. That's a very good question. In some cases, yes, but since things can change very quickly, I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, some of the changes to Reddit's platform use last year. Um, that communication and that understanding is not necessarily consistent. And um, this has some cascading effects when we talk about graduate students in particular. I know this is kind of a deviation, but as an example, I have graduate students who work with me. They're keen to collect their own data. I can communicate, here's my understanding of best practice to you. When you implement this on your own, when you're doing your own research, are you conforming to those expectations? Are you having to deviate? Are you conforming to whatever the platform terms are, not just as you understand it, but as they're legally written? And those kinds of inconsistencies make it difficult as well. So there's a lot of education that I think we could benefit from that I, I haven't necessarily seen communicated in different ways. There are certainly research seminars and things like that, but I don't know the extent to which they always address some of these concerns that we're increasingly seeing across the disciplines. And I, I think to, to pivot here, and I did tell you that we would maybe do some live Q&A, we do have some questions coming in. Um, and while we're on the topic of terms of service, uh, doesn't automated collection violate most every online platform's terms of service? It depends. If you're using the API, then probably not. If, however, the site has no API function, then if you are controlling the scrape in such a way as to appear as though you're a legitimate user and there are minimal protections in place to the site itself, and you're not damaging the infrastructure in any way, then arguably is it different from someone just simply saving every page of your site and doing so in an hour period? So yes, but if you're doing it in a way that is not necessarily violating the spirit of the terms of service, then what do we do? And that has become somewhat normalized among researchers, this idea that we can apply scraping tools and configure them in such a way as to not damage the site or its operations. And therefore it is legitimate because it mirrors what people would otherwise do with hand collection. Going back to the best practices then, like what, what challenges do researchers face in imp implementing best practices, especially regarding changes to API features or site policies? Um, you know, what challenges actually implementing that and putting that into practice? 
It really comes down to the individual researcher and their university. That's what makes this such a, a difficult space to work in, because the constraints that I might be under here at MSU could be radically different from even another university in the state. So how do I define best practice if what I have to do is different from a colleague in the same state? And so we've talked about as a field, here are some suggestions for best practices. But in doing the uh, the overall research for this paper, I found that not everybody does that. There are still individuals, for instance, reporting, I collect data from this subreddit or from this forum. Here's the forum name, and I'm going to use the individual usernames. That introduces risk. Uh, and increasingly, we're at a point where you know speech is being politicized and things like that. And so you're in a dicey position if you're studying something like extremism and you're naming the communities and the individuals. So we have best practices, but they are inconsistently applied. So I think one of the key things that we could do is create some degree of a common language within the field. Here's what you should do. You may not always do this, but it is in your best interests and ethically speaking, the interests of those you're studying to do the following, not provide actual usernames, not provide where the site is from, limit quotes. That sounds very trivial, but if you are using a very long quote from someone's post, you can quickly figure out who that person might be through a, through a simple Google search. So minimizing how you quote, or at least being careful and judicious when you apply them. It, it sounds trivial, but it, it is important. Right. Definitely. Definitely uh, hear you on that. And that goes into this uh, kind of just collaborative moment and collaborative feel of how do you see the role of Musa as we're sitting here today having this discussion and, and uh, you know, bouncing questions and thoughts back? In criminal logical research, how can Musa members serve as key partners to improve the criminal logical research that is using online data? I think having those very open lines of communication, being able to address questions about what is in violation of terms of service or what is considered acceptable, these are important things for us to understand. And again, since things can change very quickly, being able to understand from a practical research standpoint, if I wanna study this particular community tomorrow, how do I do it? And how do I do it in a way that is legally acceptable? And so having that kind of communication is important. Also being able to talk to the infrastructure owners and operators can give us a better sense of what are we potentially doing that could be damaging or how can we inform communities of potential risk points? For instance, if I'm a major web hosting service and suddenly you tell me I've got 30 carding sites that are selling personal information on my hosting platform. Certainly law enforcement could tell you that, but so can certain academics. And so how can we create communication channels for understanding best practice for research, best practice for uh, your general standpoints, ensuring legal and ethical compliance across the board? Definitely. And I, I, a point in your paper too um, touches upon, you know, the relationship between criminolog uh, criminologists uh, university and inst institutional review boards and federal funding agencies in the collaboration with Musa. Can you touch more in depth on that as you specifically call that out in your paper, um, those key uh, partners to collaborate? Yeah. Um, for instance, as a criminologist, I belong to the American Society of Criminology. I belong to the European Society of Criminology. There are all these um, disparate but related groups across the world. And we have annual conferences. We have workshops. These are perfect opportunities for us to have more of these in-depth discussions and get you know, the 30 or 40 people who are studying in this space in the same room, talking to those who are managing the infrastructure and know the ins and outs and have more of a meaningful dialogue. Uh, I have no doubt that in five years time, more graduate students, more new PhDs are gonna be using online data than what is currently taking place. We're even seeing now some interesting attempts to link uh, participants in prior survey-based research to their uh, population and their age now. And they're using social media as a means to identify those individuals again. So there are all these interesting nuances in terms of data collection and methods that I think are going to be even more transformative as, as things progress. And so the more we start having that conversation now, 
I think the better off we're going to be in a few years time. So getting everybody in the same room talking can make a huge difference because we are a, a small field, relatively speaking. In an annual conference, for instance, in the US, it's about 2000 people, as opposed to say computer science or some of the some of the engineering fields where they're, they're very big and there's diverse methods and diverse skill sets. Here we're a little smaller, and so it's it's something you can get your hands around a little bit quicker. Yeah, and so what I'm hearing is a projection into the future that there may be even more of an imbalance, and this is why this requires conversation of violating terms of service or new techniques that don't necessarily that that trigger unauthorized scraping. Um, mm -hmm. And and with that, do you think there's new methods? I mean, even with the hot topic of generative AI. In scraping, do you think there's a potential to see that increase? And then, as you mentioned, it, it really sounds like it's coming from collaboration between Musa and partners and industry folks to have those conversations and come together. Um, you know, do you see any methods changing with generative AI in, in scraping? And, and do you see that being an increase or a tool to be able to, uh, for folks to be able to use automated tooling? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, just even the idea of using AI now to generate abstracts and things like that from written materials, we're seeing academics already applying it. And it makes perfect sense that those who are already kind of competent with the use of scraping will find ways to simplify or uh, automate certain tasks through the use of AI. So I imagine that is the, the next iteration on this method of collection. And then it introduces some questions about how are we ethically using the AI in a means that uh, doesn't cause any additional harm when we're doing data collection. Because if you screw up the way that you have it configured, that's one thing. What do you do if the AI that you've tasked to do this chore makes an error? Well, then who is responsible? Is it you or is it the AI? These are the things I, I don't have a good answer for at the moment, but um, I imagine we will be having those discussions sooner rather than later. And um, also people are getting more creative with where they go for data and what the data looks like. As an example, there's a, a paper utilizing a scrape of data from Venmo to look at the way in which uh, individual transactions are communicated. So I know Venmo is set to public, but do you necessarily think that someone will be capturing that data and then analyzing it and saying how many relate to the use of you know, some specific emoji or something else? And so it's those kinds of practices that I think require some thinking and some strategic understanding of, okay, we understand how this can be used, but why would it be used in this fashion? Or what are the risks of our data being used in a certain way by an academic. And just because we we didn't say you can't do this doesn't mean somebody's not gonna try, which is unfortunate. Right, and I think, I mean, I'm sure you could tell how many times I eat out by looking at my Venmo or the collection. You could tell when and what cadence um, by just merely peeking into my Venmo and, and using that data. It, it brings up, uh, you know, that paper on Venmo and the usage of data, What for your paper, your white paper, what what do you think or what do you want folks to understand? And, and what, what do you want to communicate effectively to folks? As you just mentioned this paper influencing your thought in, in Venmo and now my thoughts going on. Wow, I have quite a few public cases of my Venmo that are out there public before I said it's private that you can see all my dinner and lunch uh, Venmos. But um, you know, going back to your paper, what would you like folks to take away and what uh, implications would you like out of your paper? Sure. I think as a discipline, we are using online data far more frequently, and we're doing so in ways that conform to the specific terms of service, but then there are others who may not be. And so the lack of consistency means we need better education. We need more understanding. As a field, we haven't gotten there. We're, we're trying to come to some consensus but there are impediments to consensus based on the understandings that we see at the institutional level. So whether it's a university's institutional review board or general counsel or some other entities, the inconsistencies make it hard. And so being able to go to you all as the infrastructure owners, as the operators, will give us the ability to really understand concretely, this is or this is not acceptable. And the more we can understand that, the better I think we can create a dialogue around online data use. 
There are times when hand collection is essential, and then there are times when automation should be fine. Uh, I saw someone say in the comments that, you know, the APIs are designed for research. Exactly true. But for some reason, not everyone uses the API. Or put differently, not everyone communicates their use of APIs in their published research. That's a, a thing that I didn't necessarily elaborate on here, but it's important because the way that we communicate to one another, particularly in our field, is through our writing. And so if I say that I've collected data from these sites and I give no other information, was it automated? Was it hand collected? If it was automated, did you use the API? These are the kinds of questions that we should be asking, but we don't always do so. Part of that is because not everyone in the field uses online data yet. So even if I have no intention as a scholar to do online data collection, I'm a, I'm a survey person or I'm an interviewer or whatever, I need to at least fundamentally understand some of these basics so I can be a better overall social scientist, so I can know what it is that someone is talking about and be able to communicate this to colleagues, to students, to whomever. So as a discipline, there's value in knowing all of these different processes. Even if we don't intend to use them ourselves, it's helpful because it sets the tone. It establishes, here's our baseline criteria, and let's try to apply that consistently. And Professor Holt, uh, you know, there are systems and in, in APIs and research specifically. Why do you think folks aren't using those programs that are available? For that talk that's offered by companies, you know, and, and it's out there and it's it's of use and it could be very helpful. Why do you think folks aren't using that? Um, it depends. In part, like if I were looking at a platform that say a forum hosted on an individually operated website, there may be no API system in place. And so then you're you're dealing with constraints of the site. If I'm talking about say Reddit or Facebook or some other social media platform with its own dedicated API, then that's an excellent question. Uh, reasons individuals may not use them could be that they're looking at individual accounts. Perhaps they are tracing one person's history over time or that of a small group. And so the perception is that the API calls are not necessary. Uh, there are a number of studies that have treated um, small samples as case studies. So I'm looking at one or two specific communities. I'm only looking at that of the, the that group as opposed to the individual members and all of their posting. So I may not need the API for all of that collection. That would be the the simplest rationale for not doing so that that immediately comes to mind. And I think folks might be interested in hearing uh, maybe not the simplest, but the more in depth in this case. And I, I do want to turn just for a moment because we keep talking about communities, which I'm very passionate about on platforms, users. So how how can a more inclusive and collaborative environment benefit user populations, platform owners, and academics? academia. So like the, the users first and then the collaboration um, prompting from the platforms to academia. Yeah, particularly for the uh, user bases. If your data is being collected, even without your necessary informed consent, then how do I know that my data will be managed properly? Not every person may read through all the terms of service or understand that their information may be used. Uh, you probably got that family member who posts, you know, you, you can't use my comments without express written permission. Very good, but that's not a guarantee that people will not uh, do that. They will do whatever they feel is appropriate. And so um, that's part of the issue is how do we collect data from individuals, do so in ways that don't aggregate to that person, communicate risk in a way that is effective. And to what extent could we? This is a, a huge problem in our discipline is that we study groups that don't like that we're studying them. So as an example, if you're looking at an active hacker community, they do not want you observing their behaviors. The same is true for extremists or really any other kind of entity that's engaged in activities that could lead to arrest. So informing them of monitoring is, is not helpful for us. So instead, we, we have to operate in a way that provides minimal harm, but ensures the, the group can continue and we can analyze their posting behaviors. 
But that doesn't necessarily translate into some spaces like Twitter or Reddit or what have you, where people are posting publicly and they may be doing so under their real identities. And so it's harder to understand exactly the boundaries, how to best protect those user bases, but we can at least fundamentally understand as researchers that we don't want to out individuals. We want to minimize the likelihood of a person's posting being linked to their identity in a data set or something that, that could lead to immediate identification. So reporting out data in the aggregate is helpful. But um, the more that we have these discussions, I think the more that researchers can understand, here's what are some downside risks for user populations. And so can uh, Musa and the infrastructure owners tell us this is okay, this is not, this is what you're gonna need to do to maintain your data effectively. And uh, even trying to find ways to provide ethically sourced data, maybe from the source, that, that is an interesting avenue that could be explored because we know people are increasingly interested in using this. Well, how do we do so in a way that minimizes effort on your end and ensures user privacy on the other? So it makes it possible for research to be done in a way that has the least impact on the users. Absolutely. And before we get to um, another question, and folks, feel free to enter those questions into the chat. Um, I do want to just broadly get your take on, do you think and how would you best, for folks listening, describe good scraping versus bad scraping? Is there good scraping? Is there bad scraping? And how would you best describe to folks listening? Uh, so I would characterize a good scrape as running through the API if it exists and can be leveraged appropriately. In the event we're talking about, like, say, a dark website that's uh, a crypto market selling drugs, well, then is a, a scrape in any way bad or is it acceptable because there may be no infrastructure in place to manage that kind of scrape? So I guess I would say a good scrape utilizes the appropriate tools and infrastructure to do so in the least invasive way possible, assuming those tools are present. The bad scrape would be you going through a site without using the API and doing so in a way that is noisy or uh, incorporates a lot of bandwidth or negatively impacts the user base. Yep. Um, and then pivoting to that question, and this is going back to our, our conversation around terms of service, is collecting by hand per hour is about 30 pages versus over a million pages in an hour. That seems to violate the spirit, doesn't it? Yes, I would say that's fair. Uh, however, this is one of those issues that we we don't necessarily see communicated publicly. As an example, there are colleagues I know who utilize data scraping against different sites. There's very little discussion on their part as to what constitutes a, a less harmful scrape or a, a scrape that is best potential practice. There's some communication of that, but there's very little of times when it has been inappropriate or led to negative consequences. And so in spirit, yes, hand collection would be the optimal because it has the least impact, but a scraper can be tuned to appear as though it's hand collection, in which case, yes, it lengthens the time of collection on the part of the researcher. But if it's automated, then by definition, you're reducing manpower, you're reducing efforts. And so it, it is beneficial in some regards. Um, yes, it could be, but if we tune it properly, is it... Uh, is it a harm? Um, I know that's a very wishy-washy answer, and I apologize if that doesn't satisfy the person who asked it. No, I, I appreciate the answer. And um, another question is, how has the development of the internet and the World Wide Web influenced the data available for criminology studies? It has opened up the entire world and done so in ways that are previously impossible. As an example, if you were interested in studying prostitution in the United States, that is a very hidden behavior with significant social consequences for those who admit to paying for different services. Now we're at a point where you can go on to any forum and find discussions about any city or town, no matter how small it is, and all the service providers and all the practices. So it has become very easy to examine a behavior that used to be extremely hidden from view. 
So it's made it simple to examine deviance that otherwise wasn't easily addressed. It's also created all these new forms of criminality and potential illegal behavior that enables studying. So as an example, with um, say crypto fraud, where somebody is trying to get you to invest in some fake cryptocurrency. Well, you can examine the exchanges between the individuals in WhatsApp groups. You can uh, trace the exchanges between Bitcoin wallets or, or other crypto wallets. So we now have alternative angles to address a research question and do so with data from multiple sources. So in some respects, it's, it's helpful because it gives us the ability to uh, triangulate and understand uh, certain experiences in one platform versus another, get different insights into offending as a whole. Absolutely. And uh, another question from someone is, how do researchers balance between automated and manual data collection methods in these different cases, in these different areas, in the different uh, cases that you're bringing up? Yeah, I think it comes down to the individual researcher. So as an example, if you're studying an offender group that you know to be very small in size, or you know the, the scope of content is very small and you're not going to be able to pull much from major social media platforms, well, then hand collection is probably going to be appropriate because you're going to spend less time, it's a little less noisy, uh, it's a little easier to ensure you, you've captured what is there. But there are times when automated collection is extremely useful because you can uh, turn on the feature to do multiple scrapes over time. So as an example, several researchers have used data scraping against dark websites to do time over time analysis. So does the price of products change in the wake of, say, a fentanyl arrest or the takedown of one market and the emergence of another? So these are times when data scraping can be invaluable because it automates the process and it gives you more information in bursts as opposed to what you could do by hand. And um, increasingly it's kind of researcher awareness as well. So those who are very familiar with how to use the tools leverage them quickly. Those like myself who are still new to it are, are figuring it out and trying to find the, the best possible practices to employ. I feel like a, a real dinosaur after having written this paper because it seems as though I'm I'm very much in the minority of hand collection anymore. So it's it's spurred me to want to really, really get my hands around this and figure out, okay, how do I do this better moving forward? So I'm a, a better scholar and a better understander of, of the current state of play. Right. Hey, I think we're all trying to move towards automation or sharpening our tools. Um, and the kind of overlying theme here is do it in a, you know, ethical manner in a way that um, really takes into consideration of users mm -hmm. and the collaboration there. Um, uh, another question that's coming up is uh, how can researchers protect the, uh, how can users better protect themselves from being scraped? So going back to kind of that doctor's office visit um, uh, analogy of uh, when I visit the doctor, yes or no, how can users better protect themselves from being scraped as well? Or is it merely on the platforms and uh, the researchers to be to come to that or put up those mechanisms of defense? It strikes me that it does come down more to the platform owner and the researcher, less so than the individual. I mean, even just the open source tools that exist to do interrogation of different platforms for OSINT analysis. So if I if I want to leverage something against Instagram, I can do so. Um, maybe you've heard of a tool called OSINTgram, which is for deep analysis of individual posts. And so those are the kinds of tools that researchers aren't leveraging, but we know law enforcement is. And so um, these are the kinds of things where there's not much that a user can do necessarily. It is incumbent on what is the researcher going to do to protect it? And then how can the platforms best manage uh, what resources are there and what can be captured? Absolutely. And I think I'll, I'll end on, or before ending, uh, go to this last question on, if you are just getting up to speed on these automated tools, how are you so knowledgeable about the scraping landscape and in this space that we're talking about and discussing today? Where did you gain all your insights and knowledge? 
Um, so I've worked with computer scientists and engineers since I really got started, and um, I have a familiarity with how these tools work. I have been doing this for a very long time, so I communicate regularly with people who are using data scraping tools. And I've talked to them about when should I use it? Why should I use it in certain contexts? And it's been a good discussion for me, but I've always been somewhat reticent to use them if for no other reason than I'm, I'm familiar with the methods that I, I've used. I feel most comfortable with those. And I'm reaching a point now where I feel like I, I need to change gears. Um, one of the things that I encourage my students to do, and, and I try to do this as much as possible, is at least understand what it is that's out there. Even if I don't use it that way, I can understand some of the ins and outs of it. As a field, um, since, for instance, our papers are all peer reviewed, you send something to a journal, it goes out to reviewers to, to blind examine. And so I know quantitative methods, I know qualitative methods, I know a little bit about scraping, I know a little bit about hand collection. That way I'm at least competent enough to, to be able to assess certain things on face. If it goes really too far in one direction, then I get out of my depth. But I can at least understand some of the steps to get to a set of conclusions. And I feel like that's one of the most important things we can do is at least to maybe not be well read, but at least try to know what's out there. Yes. Yeah. And I think the theme here is that people feel like they need to scrape to get data. And in this sense, the, the academia space, and often there are tools and things that exist where there isn't a need to scrape, but we're figuring out how to best collaborate there. And so, you know, this can vary across companies. Um, this can vary across the industry. And we're starting to see things shift. And so researchers are using data to solve tough problems and industry, you know, is supporting that in a way uh, to solve these cutting edge problems. And we should continue to have this conversation on how to do this and in an authorized and an unauthorized way and how we just stop, talk about good scraping uh, versus bad scraping. So I, I really want to thank you, Professor Holt, for, for taking the time to engage today, have this hot topic discussion. Um, I promise, you know, I would take it easy and be nice. And, and I think we had a great discussion today. And I know that this conversation isn't going to end here. And we're going to continue to have these conversations. We're going to continue to work on best practices, how we can best support and implement those. And I also wanted to, you know, thank everyone for joining today. Um, thank, thank you for everyone for tuning in and engaging through the questions in this discussion. Um, and please be on the lookout on the Musa website for more webinars and events in the near future. And if you're interested in joining Musa, send us an email. It's on the website. Um, again, Professor Holt, thank you. Thank you for everyone who joined in, in this conversation um, and look forward to the conversations in the near future. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.